Hello world, it's Siraj, and let's make our own language translator using TensorFlow. Today, there are about 6,800 different languages spoken across the world, and in an increasingly globalized world, nearly every culture has interactions with every other culture in some way. That means there are an incalculable number of translation requirements every second of every day across the world. Translating is no easy task. A language isn't just a collection of words and of rules of grammar and syntax. It's also a vast interconnecting system of cultural references and connotations. And this reflects a centuries-old problem of two cultures wanting to communicate but are blocked by a language barrier. Our translation systems are fast improving though, so whether it be an idea or story or a quest, each new advance means one less message will be lost in translation. During the Second World War, the British government was hard at work trying to decrypt the Morse-coded radio communications that Nazi Germany used to send messages securely, known as Enigma. They decided to hire a man named Alan Turing to help in their effort. And when the American government learned of their translation effort, they were inspired to try it themselves post-war, specifically because they needed a way to keep up with Russian scientific publications. The first public demo of a machine translation system translated 200 50 words between Russian and English in 1954. It was dictionary based, so it would attempt to match the source language to the target language word for word. The results were poor since it didn't capture syntactic structure. The second generation of systems used interlingua. That means they changed a source language to a special intermediary language with specific rules encoded into it, then from that generated the target language. This proved to be more efficient, but this approach was soon overshadowed by the rise of statistical translation in the early 90s, primarily from engineers at IBM. Innovation at IBM. Watch this. A popular approach was to break the source text down into segments, then compare them to an aligned bilingual corpus, using statistical evidence and probabilities to choose the most likely translation. Nowadays, the most used statistical translation system in the world is Google Translate, and with good reason. Google uses deep learning to translate from a given language to another with state-of-the-art results. So how do they do this? Let's recreate their results in TensorFlow to find out. The dataset we'll be using to train our language translation model is a corpus of transcribed TED Talks. It's got both the English version and the French version, and our goal will be to create a model that can translate from one to the other after training. We'll be using TensorFlow's built-in data utils class to help us pre-process our dataset, and we'll start by defining our vocab size, which is the number of words we want to train on from our dataset. We'll set it to 40k for each, which is a small portion of the data. Then we'll use the data utils class to read the data from the data directory, giving it our desired vocab size and it will return the formatted and tokenized words in both languages. We'll then initialize TensorFlow placeholders for our encoder and decoder inputs. Both will be integer tensors that represent discrete values. They will be embedded into a dense representation later. We'll feed our vocabulary words to the encoder and the encoded representation that's learned to the decoder. Now we can build our model. Google published a paper more recently discussing a system they integrated into their translation service called Neural Machine Translation. It's an encoder-decoder model inspired by similar work from other papers on topics like text summarization. So whereas before Google Translate would translate from language A to English to language B, with this new NMT architecture, it can translate directly from one language to the other. It doesn't memorize phrase-to-phrase -phrase translations. Instead, it encodes the semantics of the sentence. This encoding is generalized, so it can even translate between a language pair like Japanese and Korean that it hasn't explicitly seen before. So I guess we can use an LSTM recurrent network to encode a sentence in language A. The RNN spits out a hidden state s, which represents the vectorized contents of the sentence. We can then feed s to the decoder, which will generate the translated sentence in language b word by word. Sounds easy enough, right? Wrong. There's a drawback to this architecture. It has limited memory. That hidden state S of the LSTM is where we're trying to cram the whole sentence we want to translate. S is usually only a few hundred floating point numbers long. The more we try to force our sentence into this fixed dimensionality vector, the more lossy our neural net is forced to be. We could increase the hidden size of the LSTM, after all they are supposed to remember long-term dependencies. But what happens is, as we increase the hidden size H of the LSTM, the training time increases exponentially. So, to 
to solve this, we're going to bring attention into the mix. If I was translating a long sentence, I'd probably glance back at the source sentence a couple times to make sure I was capturing all the details. I'd iteratively pay attention to the relevant parts of the source sentence. We can let neural nets do the same by letting them store and refer to previous outputs of the LSTM. This increases the storage of our model without changing the functionality of the LSTM. So the idea is once we have LSTM outputs from the encoder stored, we can query each output asking how relevant they are to the current computation happening in the decoder. Each encoder output gets a relevancy score which we can convert to a probability score by applying a softmax activation to it. Then we extract a context vector which is a weighted summation to the encoder outputs depending on how relevant they are. Memory ain't enough. Pay attention. No, spare is nicht genug, passt auf. Memoria no es suficiente precedenza. Memory ain't enough. Pay attention. We'll build our model using TensorFlow's built in embedding attention sequence to sequence function, giving it our encoder and decoder inputs, as well as a few hyperparameters we define, like the number of layers. It builds a model that is just like the one we discussed. TensorFlow has several built in models like this that we can drop into our code easily. So, normally, this alone would be fine and we could run this and the results would be decent, but they added another improvement to their model that requires more code, 100 GPUs, and a week. Of training. Seriously, that's what it took. We won't implement it all programmatically, but let's dive into it conceptually. If the outputs don't have sufficient context, then they won't be able to give a good answer. We need to include info about future words so that the encoder output is determined by words on the left and right. We humans would definitely use this kind of full context to determine the meaning of a word we see in a sentence. The way they did this is to use a bi-directional encoder, so it's two RNNs, one that goes forward over the sentence and the other goes backwards. So for each word it concatenates the vector outputs which produces a vector with context from both sides. And they added a lot of layers to their model. The encoder has one bi-directional RNN layer, then seven unidirectional RNN layers. The Coder has eight unidirectional RNN layers. The more layers, the longer the training time, so that's why we use a single bidirectional layer. If all the layers were bidirectional, the whole layer would have to finish before later dependencies could start computing. But by using unidirectional layers, the computations can be more parallel. We'll initialize our TensorFlow session, then our model inside of it. Let's see some results after training. First, I'll give it this phrase. Looks good. And now another phrase. Dope. While it's not perfect and we still have a ways to go, we're definitely getting closer to having a universal translation model. Breaking it down, encoder-decoder architectures offer state-of-the-art performance in machine translation. By storing the previous outputs of LSTM cells, we can judge the relevancy of each to decide which to use via an attention mechanism, and by using a bi-directional RNN, the context of both past and future words is used to create an accurate encoder output vector. The coding challenge winner from last week is Ryan Lee. This was very impressive. He created a recipe summarizer by scraping 125,000 recipes from the web and documented it all beautifully with installation steps so you can reproduce the results yourself. Wizard of the week. And the runner up is Sarah Collins. Her code converts scientific papers to text and prioritizes them by topic. This week's coding challenge is to create a simple translation system using an encoder decoder model. All the details are in the readme, post your GitHub link in the comments and I'll announce the winner next week. Please subscribe for more programming videos, check out this related video, and for now, I've got to get a better GPU, so thanks for watching.